Okay, so welcome to Child Psychology. Today we're talking about uh, early childhood, still the ages two to six, but we're talking about cognitive development today. And we're gonna get uh, this chapter out of the way in uh, one lecture. Okay, so let's get started. Now I know cognitive development is not the most interesting stuff. <clears throat> there are some things that are a little bit interesting. Hopefully you'll find it a bit interesting. But yes, we're going to talk about uh, Piaget's theory. We're going to continue talking about that as it applies to this period of, uh, of time, right? Uh, this age of development. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Vygotsky, which you may not have heard of. We'll talk about theory of mind, language, and early education. So let's get started. Um, so remember, uh, Piaget's theory, right, um, <clears throat> describes how children, uh, uh, children's thinking advances as they get older. And we already talked about the uh, sensory motor period. And this period of time, two to six, is called the pre-operational period or the period of pre-operational thought. So during this time, language skills uh, you know, develop remarkably. We'll talk about language specifically. Uh, symbolic thought develops, um, you know, which is part of language, but also the ability to understand numbers and how to manipulate them and things like that, okay? Um, we're going to focus on what children are not so good at, as we always do with Piaget's theory. Uh, during this time, children have certain deficits, certain problems. Uh, one of us, one of them is centration. Centration is uh, when children have, when children focus on one aspect of the problem and ignore others, and that leads to errors in logic. So that's why it's called the pre-operational, uh, uh, the period of pre-operational thought, or the pre-operational period because pre-operational means before they can operate, pre means before. So before they really understand, you know, their physical world, before they understand concrete objects, okay? Uh, so they don't really even understand, you know, those kind of things yet, yet okay? Uh, they don't understand how to think logically about those things. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about that, that how, how it's related to some of these other things we're gonna mention soon. Uh, so centration, they focus on one part of the problem and ignore others. Like for instance, a lion cannot be a cat because the cat, right, cats are pets, right? You know, cats are like those little ones that you have uh, walking around. That, so that's a problem with centration. They focus on one part of the problem, you know that cats are pets, lions are not, so therefore a lion cannot be a cat, right? That's a, that's a problem with centration. They focus on one thing and, um, you know, ignore other things and that, that leads to problems, problems in their logic and their thinking. Uh, children during this time are also very egocentric, okay? They suffer from egocentrism, which means that they uh, consider themselves as the center of everything, okay? Uh, the center of the world, okay? They cannot basically consider somebody else's point of view. So for instance, um, you know, let's say you uh, tell a child, hey, you know, Jimmy, you know, fell off his tricycle today, you know, um, and let's say Jimmy is like, uh, you know, 13 years old or something like that. You know, he's still a kid, but you know, he's not a little kid, right? Jimmy's like 13 years old. Um, you know, so Jimmy, you know, scraped and hurt his knee. What can we, uh, what can we do for Jimmy to make him feel better? Okay. Uh, the child during this, uh, this stage will say, well, let's give Jimmy a teddy bear, right? Jimmy probably will not be comforted by, a, you know, a teddy bear. He's an older kid, more like a teenager, right? Uh, but a teddy bear will comfort this child. So that's what the child is thinking. He only thinks from, from his point of view or her point of view. Another example would be uh, children during this stage. Let's say you have uh, two little kids that are brothers. And you ask the one that is, during, that is in this pre-operational thought uh, stage. And you ask them, do you have a brother? That child will say correctly, yes, I have a brother. Well, what about him? What about your brother? Does he have a brother? And he'll say, no, he doesn't have a brother, right? Obviously that's wrong, but the child can only think uh, from his point of view. And that's a problem with egocentrism, okay? They cannot consider somebody else's perspective. Or if you ask them, hey, mommy's birthday's coming up. What should we get mommy? The child might say, let's get mommy a toy truck, right? Mommy would probably like a real truck, but I said, let's get mommy a toy truck because that's what they would like, right? That's what this child would like. Uh, there's also a problem where they focus on appearance and the appearance of something basically tells you what it really is, okay? So if you have short hair, that means you're a boy. 
Okay, even though there's girls that have short hair, if you have long hair, that means you're a girl, right? They focus on those things. And because of this problem with that, where they focus just on the appearance of something, uh, they can be easily frightened. Like here's somebody right here in this picture dressed up as a, a Yeti and really scaring this child, right? Thinking it's a real monster, right? Uh, but no, it's just someone dressed up in this costume, but you can easily fool them because if it looks like something scary, right? It looks like a monster, it must be a monster. Those are all problems with logic, you know, where if they stop and think, they would see that that's fake fur, it's not real, that monster cannot really exist, right? They also have other problems, and this is kind of cute. They also suffer from something called animism. Animism is the belief that natural objects and phenomena are alive. So they believe that certain things could be alive, like, they, you know, they might have a pet rock or something like that. Or maybe they believe that, that you know, their teddy bear is alive or their tricycle is alive or something like that. So children can hold both rational and magical ideas. So this is like when they believe in magical stuff, right? Like, you know, the child might say, the sun is sad today because it is cloudy and he can't shine, right? We can't see the sun. We can't see him. So he's sad, right? Um, the sun isn't really alive, but children will talk like this sometimes. Or, you know, the child might say, my tricycle is mad at me, right? It made me fall and scrape my knee. Um, so they could also have imaginary friends, you know, like I said, a pet rock, or just believe that certain things are alive when in reality, they're not, okay? Or maybe there's a, a mouse or something, you know, that kind of, uh, that they've seen in the house, and they might believe that that mouse is their friend or something like that, when it's just a mouse that just runs around and is trying to avoid, you know, getting caught, okay? So this is really cute ideas that they have, right? Uh, part of being a kid, that's called animism. Um, there's other problems, other deficits. There's also static reasoning, uh, where basically they assume that the world doesn't change, that things don't change and can't change, right? So they might believe, for instance, that teachers just teach, right? That's what a teacher is. It's static. Teachers don't change. That's how teachers are, right? Teachers don't shop, right? They don't dance, right? Uh, they don't party or something like that. Just teachers are teachers, right? That's static reasoning. And there's a cute little story I heard about of uh, kindergartners once coming into, a, uh, into the classroom and meeting the teacher, you know, um, and, uh, and then the teacher gave them a tour of the classroom, right? Told them wh where everything is. And one child asked, you know, as, as, as the kids were getting a tour of the classroom, uh, where is the bed? Where, where does the teacher sleep, right? That's this problem with static reasoning. They don't understand that teachers have other lives. They're not just teachers, right? Things don't necessarily stay the same. They're not always the same, okay? But that is static reasoning. There's also a problem with irreversibility. They don't believe things could be undone, that things can be reversed. So if they don't like lettuce and you put lettuce on their hamburger, right? They won't like that. They won't want to eat it, right? But if you take away the lettuce, it's not good enough. It's saying, no, you ruined my burger or you contaminated it. I, I'm not going to eat this thing. Or if you stain their shirt, right? Uh, and, you know, they believe that you've ruined their shirt and, uh, you know, that it's just ruined, that they need to throw it away and get a new one, right? Um, even though you tell them, I can wash it, right? I can wash it and get the stain out. Like, no, the shirt is ruined, right? It's irreversible. They believe in things like this. They can't really undo things. They also have problems with logic. All these things we're kind of talking about are problems with logic, okay? But one particular important problem with logic is the, uh, is the idea of conservation, um, they have problems with that. Conservation is the idea that uh, the amount of something is unaffected by changes in, in its appearance, right? Conservation is basically the idea that something can look different, but it's still the same. Okay, I'm gonna have to explain that. Two-year-olds lack this, okay? Uh, two to six-year-olds can lack this, right? Depending on uh, what type of conservation we are, we're talking about and, um, and the particular child. Some children acquire this sooner than others. But here, uh, this next slide will help you understand conservation. Here are some conservation tasks, basically. Some things that involve conservation. The idea that something can look different and still be the same. Like uh, conservation of volume, that's the first uh, row of images there. Conservation of volume, you have two equal glasses of liquid, right? You fill up two glasses um, to the same level, let's say with some water. Um, and you ask the child, <clears throat> uh, are these, are these the same or are they different? Do these have the same amount or do they have a different amount, okay? 
and the child will look at them closely and say, they're the same, right? That's easy, okay? And now you take uh, one, of them, uh, in, uh, one of them and you pour it into a taller, thinner glass and you do this right in front of them. And now you compare the two, uh, the two glasses of liquid there and you ask them, do these have the same amount or are they different? The child will look at it closely again and will say, this one, the taller one, has more, right? Even though they saw the same amount of fluid going from one to the other. That's a problem with conservation, okay? They don't understand that something can look different and still be the same. It's also, you know, a problem with centration. They focus on the height of the glass and ignore the width. Similar problem with the number of pennies, right? They understand that those two rows there have the same amount, okay? Uh, they might even count them, right? But then if you take one row of pennies and you stretch it out a little bit more, and you do this right in front of them, and you ask them, now does one row have more or do they have the same amount? And they'll say, this one has more, the top row, even though it's the same number of pennies. It just takes up more space. It must have, you know, uh, more pennies. Same thing with conservation of matter there. Two balls of clay, they understand those two balls of clay have about the same amount. Squash one of them, stretch it out a little bit, and they will think that the one that looks longer now has more. That's conservation of matter. Conservation of length, those two sticks are equal length. They understand that. But take one and move it forward a little bit, and they will think that the one that's moved forward a little bit is actually longer. So they lack conservation. They don't understand that something could uh, look different, but it's still the same, still the same amount, for instance. Uh, those are all problems with logic, okay? Uh, and that's why it's called the pre-operational period, because they don't even yet understand how to think logically about the physical world. That's why it's called pre-operational. They can't really operate on their physical environment yet. Let's keep going. Um, so that's uh, the part of Piaget's theory that applies to the, you know, two to six years of age. There is another theory that I want to present, and that is Vygotsky's theory. Uh, Vygotsky um, basically reasoned that children actually learn and acquire knowledge as apprentices. An apprenticeship is basically a, uh, a situation where um, a younger, less skilled person learns from an older, more skilled person. You know, it's just like when you're going to learn a trade. Let's say you're going to learn carpentry or something like that, and you're new, and you're going to learn from somebody who's more skillful, right? Maybe like your dad or something like that, or maybe uh, somebody else uh, on the job, let's say, if you have an apprenticeship, right? And you're going to observe them, and you're going to help them. They're going to guide you, right? Vygotsky reasoned that that's the way children learn. So children's learning is embedded in a social content. They learn as being part of a group, part of a society, okay? They ask questions about how machines work, why the weather changes, all these things. And older, more knowledgeable members of society, you know, provide answers for that or guide them to, you know, uh, to understanding those things. So they, they learn through an, uh, an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship is where children's learning is directed by older, more skillful members of society or more skillful members of their culture. Their culture is important. Okay. And uh, there's more to this. How does this uh, work? Uh, well, children learn through what he called guided participation, okay? So they participate uh, in what's happening, but they are guided by an older, more skilled member, okay? They're guided, and they're provided with something called scaffolding. You need, you need to provide scaffolding for children to make it easier for them to understand something, easier for them to do something. Scaffolding, um, some of you know what that is. Scaffolding, uh, if you think about it as something physical, is basically, um, you know, those, uh, those metal bars and planks that you see like when they're building a house, it allows the construction workers to reach the higher levels of the house so they can work on those. Or if there's a building, scaffolding might also be, you know, those temporary structures that they build alongside the building to help them get to a higher level, okay? Something similar is happening with learning here, according to Vygotsky. Uh, older members of society need to provide scaffolding, okay? Some kind of support, some temporary support uh, in order to help the child uh, basically advance to the next level. It's a way of guiding them, scaffolding. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. <clears throat> let's say you want to teach a child, let's say, uh, uh, algebra, let's say. That might be really difficult for a child, that's, let's say, that's like six years old or five years old, right? Uh, but maybe the child already maybe knows uh, 
you know, how to count, you know, and maybe even how to add some numbers. But you can, uh, you can provide some scaffolding and you could say, okay, if we have two little rocks over here and then we add a certain number over here and the amount we're gonna add is gonna be in this little box, right? And that's gonna equal three rocks, right? How many rocks need to be in this little box, right? For there to be three. And the child can understand, oh, one more rock will go in there, right? And they'll understand that that box means that there's something missing, okay? Well, you can tell the child, well, this little box is just like something we can call an X. It's just something we don't know about. Think of it like a box, right? That's scaffolding. You know, when they provide you with pictures or other little things to make things easier. Uh, you know, um, could be many different things. Uh, like when children are learning also, like how to uh, write the letters. You know, uh, young children at this age, they might get, um, they might get these letters with, that are in little dots and they have to learn how to trace them, right? That's temporary support. Eventually they'll get better at tracing them and then they won't need that, okay? But it helps bring them to the next level, okay? It helps get them to the next step. That's scaffolding, it's temporary support. You know, it's part of that guided participation. And the scaffolding uh, draws the child into what's called the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development are skills, they could be cognitive skills, right? mental skills and physical skills um, that the child can do only with assistance, but they can't do them on their own. So the person can exercise those skills with assistance, but not independently. That means the zone of proximal development is basically those things that the child can do with help, but not by themselves. So notice uh, the child might maybe uh, cannot trace the letters uh, very well on their own. But if you provide some assistance, the little the letters with the little uh, dotted lines or with the little dots, right? Then they can do it. That is the zone of proximal development, right? It's it's some it helps. It it's basically something that they cannot do on their own. They can't trace the letters very well on their own, but with a little bit of support, they can do it with a little bit of assistance. That's what we're talking about. That's the zone of proximal development. And for those of you who are more visual, this will help you understand over here. So you have, a, I think we call this a Venn diagram or something like that, right? And there's a video of Vygotsky there. And one of them has to do with like his story and stuff like that. And, um, and there might even be another one that tells you about, actually, I'm, I don't recall if there's another one, but uh, anyway, that video is about Vygotsky. But uh, you have these two circles here. Now, the one in the uh, burgundy there, if that's how it looks to you, that color there, the purplish one, um, things in that circle represent the things that the child can do on his or her own. The things they don't need help with, the things that are easy for them, they can do it on their own. And then we have uh, the things in beige, right? Uh, those are the things that the child uh, cannot do, okay? Those are the things in beige, okay? So that's outside their level of development, okay? They can't do that, okay? And then you have stuff that's in the middle stuff that's in the zone of proximal development that those are the things that they can do if you help them they can't do it on their own okay but they can do it if you help them okay that's the zone of proximal development okay now keep in mind the things that are in there uh, are in the purple side in that purple circle right the things they can do on their own those are things that are easy for them if class just consists of things like that for them they get bored it's too easy. And then the stuff that's outside the zone and, and that stuff they can't do on their own, if you give them a bunch of that stuff, right, uh, what happens is they can't do it, they get frustrated and they give up. If you give them the stuff that they can't yet do on their own, but they can do with help, right, that's where teaching comes in, you help them, right, that is their zone of proximal development. That is where your teaching should be targeted. That is where the guidance occurs. That is, how that is where children learn, according to Vygotsky, right? And that makes a lot of sense. And we need to look for that sweet spot, so to speak, uh, where we can really help them and guide them to the next step. Okay, that's it for Vygotsky. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about children's theories. You know, children uh, start developing these ideas about how the world works, how things work, how people, how other people think. Uh, and, um, you know, those are theories, okay? 
a theory is an explanation of something. Uh, there's something known as theory theory. It basically means that children start developing theories about how other people think. So theories about other people's theories. So people have theories about the way they think the world works, and then children start thinking about what that person believes about how things work. And that's called theory theory. So children attempt to explain everything they see and hear, right? Theories do not appear randomly, okay? Children develop these theories about intentions before they employ their impressive ability to imitate. So children start developing theories about what other people intend to do or how things are gonna work. And those are theories. So it's a mental thing, right? We start to try to understand how other people think, how something's gonna happen, right? Um, those are explanations. Um, I know that that sounds a little confusing, but I really need you to know about this theory of mind. <clears throat> um, theory of mind is uh, an example of this. Theory of mind. Theory of mind is basically just an understanding of how people think, a prediction of what goes on in another person's mind. So it's one thing for children to understand how they think or understand things from their point of view, but eventually they get to an age where they start trying to understand what somebody else is thinking. And that is called theory of mind. Remember at first they're very egocentric. They can only think from their own point of view, but eventually they start developing this thing called theory of mind. They start, they start, they start trying to think about how other people think. So children must realize that other people don't necessarily think the same thoughts they do, okay? And that, you know, things could be different for that person. At about age four is when children start acquiring this theory of mind, okay? They try to understand, for instance, why someone is angry. What is that person thinking? They may not be angry, but why is that person angry? What are they thinking? When someone would be generous, right? When will mommy, you know, allow them to have some ice cream? Or maybe give them some money or something like that, right? How to avoid aunt, the, their aunt's kiss, right? They have to think about what the aunt is thinking about and try to avoid her. That's all theory of mind. You're trying to understand what somebody else is thinking. By three to six years of age, children realize that what people think may not represent reality and that people can be fooled and deceived, right? So if people have their own thoughts, that means that their thoughts can sometimes be wrong and it maybe doesn't represent what's really happening. So people can be fooled, they can be deceived. So here's an example of a theory of mind to help you understand this, okay? And how people can be fooled and deceived, okay? Uh, so three-year-olds can confuse belief with reality. For three-year-olds, it's basically what they think is what they believe reality is, okay? Um, but uh, that changes when they develop theory of mind. So let's have this, let's go over this example here so you can understand theory of mind a little bit more. So an adult shows uh, a child a candy box, maybe a box like that, except that the box isn't open, okay? The can't, well, the box is not open. They can't see what's inside, and it might even have a picture of some candy on the box, okay? So the adult shows the child the box, say, what's inside? And the child says, candy. After all, it's a candy box, right? The adult says, let's open the box and find out. The child says, oh, holy moly, pencils. So there's pencils inside the box, okay? So the child was fooled into thinking there was candy in there, right? But there were pencils in there. The adult says, before we open the box, what did you think was inside? The child says, pencils. Uh, that's obviously wrong. The child thought candy was inside the box. But remember, the child, a three-year-old child, believes that what they think is actually reality. So now that they are thinking that there's, now that they know and think that there's candy in there, they believe that that's always what they thought all along. And that's not true. And that should say that the adult right there, the adult says, Nikki, a friend has not seen the box. What will Nikki think is inside the box when she sees it? If the child had theory of mind, the child would say that Nikki is gonna think there's candy inside the box, just like she did, okay? Because the person can be fooled. Their thoughts can be different than what the reality is. But this child says that, you know, that Nikki's gonna think pencils are in the box because that's what she knows is in the box now, and she cannot think that somebody else could be thinking something differently. So this child doesn't yet have theory of mind. So theory of mind is basically the idea that, that somebody else has their own thoughts, that people think differently, and they may be thinking something different than what is actually happening. 
or something different than you may be thinking. And there's a couple of videos there that you can look at. I'm not gonna try to play them here because it doesn't work very well on Zoom. And this is what would make the lecture longer, okay? Um, but since we're skipping that, we're gonna get it done in, uh, in one lecture, this chapter. There are things that influence theory of mind. Um, one of those things that's very important is maturation of the prefrontal cortex, okay? Uh, basically, development of the front part of the brain, okay? Remember, the front part of the brain is the part of the brain that allows you basically to focus on things, right? It allows you to control yourself. It allows you to be self-aware, right? Um, to control your emotions. Uh, maturation, right, or further development of that part of the brain helps children understand, develop theory of mind. It helps them to stop and think, basically. And this part of the brain continues to develop, by the way, into late teens, early 20s, according to some researchers. But it's, it's developing all along. And this will be related to a lot of things we talk about uh, for child uh, development. So maturation of prefrontal cortex helps them develop theory of mind. But so does social interaction, right, especially mother-child interactions right? Conversations with the mother, right? You know, where the mother, you know, ha, you know, has the child basically think about things. Let's think about how might this person feel, right? What is she doing? You know, those kind of things, right? It promotes language development and the development of theory of mind to have these interactions with the mother, these conversations. And mothers are the ones who are more involved with their children. Yes, fathers are involved, but mothers are the ones that are more nurturing, more communicative, and they tend to have these conversations more with their children. Having an older brother and sister also helps because when you have an older brother and sister uh, or sister, uh, you have to think about what they're thinking and they may not be thinking the same thing as you. And you have to try to understand them, okay? Um, and it's, it's important that they're older because when they're older, they think differently. If they're younger, then they think like an, a younger child and that's something that, you know, that the other child can relate to, but it's hard for them to relate to the older brother who thinks differently. So they have to try to understand them. So that helps with the development of theory of mind. Let's talk about language. After all, we are talking about cognitive development. So as we mentioned during Piaget's theory, right, um, there's a lot of language development uh, during this time from ages two to six. Um, and I think I might have said this before, but if I did, here it is again. Um, language, uh, used to be thought of as, uh, as being a sort of a, a, a critical period, right? Uh, uh, that there, there was a critical period to language development. A critical period is the only time when something can be mastered. So if there's a critical period for language, it's the only time you can master a language, right? And the best time for learning a second or third language. So if you believe that there's a critical period to language, that means that if you don't learn it during a certain time or by a certain time, that you're not gonna be that good at it. And, you're, and, and if you don't learn it, if you don't learn a second or third language during that time that you're not gonna be able to learn it later on. And that's not quite true, okay? People can actually master their native language even after early childhood. There's children who have been deprived and isolated and didn't learn much language early on. They will be behind, right? Uh, the lang their language development will be behind, but they can still learn language afterward and they can master it. Okay, um, it's just that they're behind and they need to catch up, right? People can master a second language even after puberty. You can learn a second language, a lot of people have, right? Even in later adulthood, okay? So we don't have so much of a critical period of language as we do a sensitive period. A sensitive period for language development means that it's the time when vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation, right, is most easily learned. So we have a sensitive period for language, right? There is a time when it's the easiest to learn it, okay? When it's almost effortless, it, it almost seems, right? Um, that's a sensitive period. It's not true that, it's the on, that, that there's, a, there's a time when it's the only time to learn language. That would be a critical period. But there's, it's more of a sensitive period. It's just easier when you're younger, during this time, ages two to six. And let's talk about how language develops uh, from this time. So vocabulary expands rapidly during this time. And children vary a lot, by the way, okay? Uh, the average two-year-old, I mean, could know anywhere from 100 to 2,000 words. Well, it depends on your child, right? Are they at the lower end? They might only know about 100 words, or on the higher end, they might know about 2,000 words. Um, and I think I told you guys already, remember that uh, on average, 
girls develop language faster than boys. So your boys might be the ones that are more on the, on the lower end and girls a little bit more on the higher end, but it depends on the child, okay? Um, and they may know up to 5,000 to 30,000 words by age six. That's a lot of words, okay? Uh, that's quite, uh, quite a rapid growth. So there's rapid growth of, of, of language, right? Vocabulary expands rapidly, okay? Uh, by the way, that seems like a lot of words by age six. Yes, they know a lot of words, but keep in mind, there's like a million words in the English language, and you know a hell of a lot more than that, okay? But for a six-year-old, 30,000 is a lot, but they may know only about 5,000, but for a two-year-old, 100 to 200 words, okay? So there's quite a, it grows very rapidly, okay? Two-year-olds can, two to six-year-olds can learn about 10 words a day, okay? Think about you trying to learn vocabulary, French, or whatever it is, and trying to learn 10 words a day would probably be, uh, you know, require some effort. Children do this without even trying, okay? They learn like 10 words a day just because of all the things that they're exposed to. They're learning very rapidly. And it's been said that they learn a lot of these words through what's called fast mapping. It's a way of acquiring new words where they mentally place the words into known categories. Like they can learn the word tiger because it's a kind of animal. It falls into the category animal. And it also falls into the category big cats, right? which also contains lion. They already know what a lion is. A lion is a big cat, it's an animal. And now they learn the word tiger. It's also a big cat, right? It's also an animal. And boom, just like that, they know what the word tiger means. You can do the same thing, by the way, when and you wanna learn uh, new words, whether they're words in the English language, advanced college level words, or French words, right? If you, if you put those words into categories of other words that are similar, you will learn them very easily. But children do this without even trying, okay? They're, they're, their minds are just organizing the information. Okay, more about language. By age three, uh, the use of grammar um, is uh, impressive. Uh, by age three, grammar, you know, the use of grammar is just much better. Uh, they know, for instance, uh, without even thinking about it, to place the subject before the verb. They know that the right way to say something is like, you know, that, you know, cat runs, right? The cat runs, not runs the cat, right? Uh, just through experience, they learn that that's the way you do it. They won't be able to tell you, yeah, the subject goes before the verb, right? That's called grammar when you learn those rules. But just through experience, just through the things that they hear and, and them using language, they will know that that's the way you say it. They know you place the adjective before the noun, that you say wet dog, okay? By the way, in Spanish, it's the opposite. In Spanish, it's perro mojado. In Spanish, it's the noun before the adjective. So the rules can differ depending on the language. Okay, but just through experience, they're learning these things and they seem to use it properly. They seem to use grammar properly. They use past, present, and, ten and future tense. Okay, all those things. Um, and really without trying much, they can't really tell you what the rules are. Okay, but they know how to use language just through their experience of using language and talking to other people. More about language. There are some problems that remain, okay. Uh, by age three, they have these, you know, these problems. They, there's a um, very well-known problem known as over-regulation when they use the rules of grammar unnecessarily, okay? Here's the thing about the English language, okay? Um, the English language has different rules for different words, okay? Uh, like, for instance, like adding an S to a word uh, to make it plural, uh, doesn't always apply. It applies to some words like cat, you add an S, it's cats, right? Or uh, dogs, right? You added an S, that makes it plural. But it doesn't work for some words, right? Like you don't say foots, it's, you know, a foot, that's one foot, but then to make it plural, you say feet, okay? So it's a different rule. Tooths, right? Similar, right? It's first, if you have one tooth, right? Or you have several teeth. Sheep doesn't need an S, okay? Mouse is, is mice, plural, right? Um, so the rules change. They're different depending on which words we're talking about. And the reason for that is because, believe it or not, English is a complicated language, and it's a language that's made up of a, bu of a bunch of other languages. In the English language, you have some words that come from German. You have some that come from Italian, some that come from Spanish. It's a language actually made up of a whole bunch of other languages. And the rules are sometimes different. Here's a more advanced word for you guys. Maybe a kid wouldn't learn at this age, but you know, like the word kernel, right? 
If you've never seen that word before, you're going to spell it very wrong. You might spell it, you know, K-E-R-N-E-L. But if you're talking about colonel, like the person in the military, it's spelled completely different. Why? Because it's a French word. It's not, it doesn't sound the way it's spelled. So children have, they, you know, they overregulate. That means they try to apply the same rules to things to which it doesn't apply. And they're going to have to learn through experience, right, that there are exceptions. Um, other problems remain. They have problems with words that express comparisons, like tall and short. They don't really understand what that means, right? They might use words like that, but incorrectly. Or if you tell them that something is tall, they don't really understand what that means. Is it because it, is it tall relative to them, tall relative to an adult, right? Same thing with short, near and far. What does that mean, right? Uh, shallow, deep, right? Uh, all this depends on the context. So they need experience with those words, right? They need more experience to really understand what they really mean, okay? Words like here, there, yesterday, tomorrow can also be confusing, right? The three-year-old might not understand what you mean by tomorrow. And they might ask, is it tomorrow yet, right? Because tomorrow we're going to Disneyland. Is it tomorrow yet, right? No, it's not, right? Come here, go there can be confusing. You have to point, come here, go there, you know, for the average three-year-old. Remember, we're talking about ages two to six, right? So earlier on, you know, they have trouble with this stuff, okay? Because these things imply context, okay? They imply, you know, comparing it to something else. Let's keep going. Uh, what about those that are bilingual? What about those that learn uh, more than one language at a time? Or those that just learn a second language, okay? Um, well, bilingualism has both advantages and disadvantages, okay? Um, uh, there's a typo there, but those that are bilingual are less egocentric when it comes to understanding language. What that's supposed to say is less egocentric in understanding language, okay? Um, because if you're bilingual, you've had to basically think about how other people speak, right? You've had to think about another language that you don't speak and try to understand how what those people are saying, what they're thinking. So it makes you less egocentric. You've had to place yourself in somebody else's shoes, so to speak, right? So you, you become less egocentric, right? More advanced in theory of mind, right? Again, you have to understand how other people think, what other people are saying. So it helps you develop theory of mind a bit faster and you're a bit more advanced there. But you'll be slower in both languages. Reading and comprehension will be slower uh, because, uh, you know, the brain is wired differently when you learn and you're learning different languages at the same time. Uh, you know, you, it, will slow you, it will slow you down if you have to like switch mentally from one uh, to the other. You would be faster if you, just, if, if you just learn one language and that's all you learn, okay? Um, there's also a language shift that occurs where you may become more fluent in the new language, right? And that happens to a lot of children for whom English is not, not their native language, not their first language. And they start going to school, they're very young, right? And they start learning English uh, and they don't get much education in their native language, but a lot of education in English and they can become a lot better at English than they are at their native language. And sometimes they may refuse to speak their native language because they see their native language as lower status, right? Spanish or Chinese or whatever it is, uh, because most people in this country, you know, speak English, okay? Um, yeah, there's plenty of people like that who think that it's bad to speak that other language. It makes them lower class, right? And of course, parents and, you know, and, and their grandparents, you know, can get very upset by that and say, you know, what's wrong with you? Why, do, why don't you want to speak, you know, Italian anymore or Spanish or whatever it is, you know? But that can happen. They'll learn as they get older that it's not necessarily a bad thing, right, to speak another language other than English, okay? Um, and uh, they may even become what's called a balanced bilingual. A balanced bilingual is someone who speaks both languages very well without a hint of the other. There's no accent in either language. They can be, speak both languages very fluently and you won't be able to tell that they're not a native speaker. Uh, there's a lot of people like that. Um, especially in Europe, because there's a lot of different countries right next to each other, you know, France and, you know, I don't know where, they're, where they are, but you know, there's France, Germany, uh, Italy, all these places, and they speak different languages, and they're all part of the European Union now. And they actually, uh, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that they consider you to be basically illiterate if you don't speak at least three languages, right? 
Whereas here in this language, if you, it, it, I mean, there's only one language that kind of matters. You speak English, right? And if you don't speak English, then they look down on you. Uh, but in Europe, if you don't speak at least three languages, they look down on you. Here, if you speak, you know, more than one language, which means you speak English and another one, they look down on you here. Like, you know, that means you're from somewhere else. Um, but it's actually the opposite. If you speak more language, more languages, you're actually more advanced, okay, in, in your language development. Okay, um, let's talk about early education. After all, there is a period, this is a period of time when children uh, begin uh, education, right? Uh, you might, they might start preschool kindergarten, depending on how old they are, right? Um, we talked about, I believe we talked about daycare already, right? Um, you know, that can occur even earlier. But let's hear, we're talking about, let's say things like preschool and kindergarten, right? Um, and what you want for early education, right, is you want child-centered programs. Programs that stress the child's development and growth, right? Where, where um, you know, the, the needs of the child and what the child is ready to learn, that is what considered it you know, right, as far as, to, you know, to guide their development, their growth, right? So there's stress the children's need to grow and explore, right? Not necessarily the need to follow directions. We'll talk about that, right? But the child's need, the child's need to grow and explore, right? Um, they're not like adults, right? Children don't necessarily want to follow directions. It doesn't mean they shouldn't, but they have different needs. Children discover ideas at their own pace. That's the Piaget model, right, about how children learn. They discover ideas at their own pace. Okay, some children are more advanced than others, and you need to work with the child. Uh, it also includes things like dress up clothing, art supplies, blocks, toys. Children learn through playing, right? Through putting on performances, through uh, basically doing things, right? Artistic expression, they also learn through that. And children will also learn from other children, you know, with guidance from the teacher, of course, you know. But children learn from each other. Child-centered programs stress those kind of things. And let's talk about some of these child-centered programs. And by the way, it's not what you get in public school, okay? <clears throat> so let's talk about this. One example of this would be uh, Montessori schools. And when I talk about schools like this, I'm gonna talk about a couple. Uh, these are things that basically, you want your child to go to one of these schools. These are more like private schools and you'd have to pay for them, okay? And they're not cheap, all right? But uh, Montessori schools, um, you know, they give uh, children a, you know, Structured individualized projects, right? That give them a sense of pride and accomplishment. So there is structure, right? They do follow certain rules and then you do things at certain times, but they have projects that are individualized, right? Projects that are, you know, good for the child and whatever level the child is at, okay? Because some children are ahead of others, some are behind, right? Um, and things that give them a sense of pride and accomplishment, right? Things that they can solve like a puzzle. Uh, and they'll, you know, put up uh, children's artwork on the walls and those kind of things to give them a sense of pride and accomplishment. Children will learn from activities that seem like play. Children learn from play. By the way, when it comes to children, everything is learning, okay? They learn from everything. So they also need to learn from play and that's good for children. They like to play and they can learn through play. Children, children I mean ch children, teachers provide tasks that reflect the cognitive eagerness of the child, right? Some are more eager than others. Some are, you know, are more advanced than others, right? But they'll use things that they use things that reflect language, order, and where children get to use all their senses, right? Not just listening and seeing, but they'll get to use their sense of smell and the sense of taste. You know, when they're talking about fruits and vegetables, they will actually bring stuff in and they'll talk about the food groups and, and they'll cut the fruit into little pieces and they'll share it with the children. They'll let children taste it and touch it so they can know, you know, they can use all their senses, okay? and children learn through all those things. Here's some examples, okay, of, uh, of the curriculum of Montessori, uh, uh, Montessori school, you know, schools and their kindergarten program, okay? So they have practical exercises where children learn how to button their shirt, tie their shoes, clean up after themselves, that's clean house, right? Uh, good manners, that kind of stuff. So they learn a whole bunch of things you wouldn't necessarily think are, are part of education, right? Things that help them, okay? How to tie their shoes, button their shirt, right? Clean up after themselves and manners, right? A lot of people complain that we don't have any manners, okay, here in the U.S., or we have very bad manners. Um, we don't really teach that in school, but there are some programs where they do, okay? My mom would always complain that I don't have good manners. I don't say hi and when I walk in and things like that, and I tell her, hey, mom, it's, you were supposed to teach me that stuff, right? They don't teach you that at school. In some places, they do. There's also sensorial exercises where they basically use their sense of touch, feeling, taste, smell, like I talked about, right? They also, you know, children learn math, 
you know, counting, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, right? Uh, through physical things, right? By looking, by, you know, handling little rods, beads, spindles, cubes, little cards, counters, right? Um, by using objects, that's how they understand numbers at first. They're, they refer to physical things. They also learn uh, the English language, how to trace the letters, listen for sounds, play word games, matching words and pictures, right? Phonics, word building. They will also learn a foreign language, maybe like Spanish or French, right? Geography, they learn geography, where things are on a map, right? Social studies, they learn about other cultures through photographs, maps, stories, right? Uh, music and art, right? Poetry, nursery rhymes, songs, all those things, right? Help children learn. So there's a lot of things there, right? Um, there's also the Reggio Emilia approach, uh, another uh, type of child-centered program. Uh, where children are encouraged but not required to master skills such as writing and using their tools early, right? So they encourage children to learn, but they don't force them, okay? Children have to be ready, you know, to learn. They have to be motivated. They have to want it, so to speak. No large group instruction, nor formal lessons, right? So they, it's not like they have kids just sitting down in some big room, a lot of kids and one teacher, right? That's not, that's not very good for children for their learning. Uh, no formal lesson. Uh, there's different things happening all the time in the classroom. Okay, it's not like they have one lesson and they're all gonna follow it, okay? There's different things happening for different children. Children are seen as powerful learners, competent, creative, right? And they also learn from others, right? The school has a large central uh, room, right? Floor to ceiling windows, right? Big mirrors, lots of space. Low teacher child ratio, right? Low teacher child ratio, that's important. Might only be like 10 kids in that class, okay? And it might be a teacher, an aide, or a couple of aides, okay? So all children can get individual attention, right? They display children's artwork, right? Big mirrors, right? Where they can, you know, use mirrors, windows and stuff. They encourage children to actually look outside and think about what's happening out there. And they actually go outside and they talk about things as opposed to, you know, classrooms like you get in public schools where if there are windows, they cover them up or they don't want you looking out there because it distracts kids from what they're supposed to be doing. Because what we have here, what we have with public schools are teacher directed programs uh, and it's not very good okay they stress academics that are taught by teachers to the entire class one teacher right usually teaching an entire group of kids and it's a big group of kids because they don't have the funds to have really small classes okay they need more teachers for that more classrooms more schools actually there's a very formal structured curriculum right where they learn letters words numbers and if you know about how teaching works um, Public school teachers, they have this big, huge binder that talks about, that basically describes everything that they have to teach. That on this day, at this time, they need to teach this. And, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, they need to be teaching this other thing. And there's a plan that they have to follow. It's very structured. And everybody is assumed to be at the same level and, and work at the same pace. And that's not the way children are. Okay. Um, they teach procedures, right? Teach children how to listen sit there quietly and follow the rules, right? A lot of it is just following the rules and doing what you're told, right? They teach basic skills like reading, writing, arithmetic, um, you know, uh, art, music, play, those things aren't always stressed. But you can see that it's not as good as those child center programs. The good news is that because of research and because of those other programs, even in public schools now, they're incorporating some of those other things we just talked about, you know, to make it better. But for the most part, teacher-directed programs are different and they're not as good, okay? Because it's basically, it's like uh, you basically are, uh, what you're taught is to do as you're told, right? Do this and do it this way and do it at this time. And basically it's more about just doing what you're told and not really exploring and learning at your own pace and, and building on your strengths, basically. Um, there's also early education. There's, there's been attempts to, um, to help children who may be behind or may, or may have, uh, you know, uh, may be at risk uh, for like failing and, uh, you know, uh, not excelling in school. Uh, yes, there are children who are very disadvantaged, right? Um, and those are usually the poor kids. Uh, a lot of minority children are poor. More, uh, more minority children are, are poor than white kids. White kids can also be poor as well, but poor kids, minority children, right? Uh, are often more at risk uh, for being disadvantaged. Uh, you know, they're disadvantaged, they're more at risk for failing in school, 
not excelling, not moving on to college and that kind of stuff. So there's programs, early uh, education programs that have been developed. One of these uh, that has a lot of history is Head Start. It's a federally funded program, which means the federal government provides a lot of money for it, right? Uh, you know, that provides early education for poor minority children, right? Um, <clears throat> they provided a, lo a lot of things, you know, to, to give you a little bit more information. Uh, I mean, it's not just uh, education, not just, uh, you know, things like preschool and things like that, which, you know, a lot of kids that are poor don't even go to preschool. They can't afford that, right? Not just, you know, early education like preschool and things like that, but also, um, you know, uh, things like uh, vouchers for like nutrition and supplies and things like that, basically, that these children would otherwise lack, right? Provided a lot, a lot of uh, things that, uh, that could be useful, okay? The quality and the effectiveness of the program has been questionable, okay? Children do get better, but some people criticize that the improvement in skills is temporary, okay? Um, it may provide long-term benefits for those children who are disadvantaged. The program was meant mostly for those children who are disadvantaged and that's where it has the greatest benefit if your child is not disadvantaged and they're doing fine and then they get this and then you put them in the head start program because you want them you know to basically you want to take advantage of this program um your child won't benefit as as much because they're not as needy it's it it, uh, it helps those children who are more disadvantaged who are more disadvantaged it helps them more okay because those are the ones that are great at risk for failure um here, there's a study that was done to show how effective these types of programs are, okay? Uh, the Cal Carolina Avesidarian Project uh, was a study that was done where they studied 111 children who were at risk for failure. Children who were poor, they had a lot of hardship in their family, uh, you know, just a uh, difficult all around situation, things that we talked about, you know, poverty, you know, maybe even single parenthood, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, a lot of issues. Um, children who had a, basically were at risk. For, for failing, okay? Um, these uh, needy children, right? Half of them were assigned to the treatment group. And those that were assigned to the treatment group, they got three years of, um, uh, basically, of, um, you know, of, of uh, basically intensive uh, kind of education where they, they sought to improve their language, right? Their cognitive skills, their social skills, uh, even provide them with uh, skills to help them with uh, pre-reading, right? You know, and math, right? So a lot of, um, work was done there to help these children catch up and they provided uh, those kind of things, okay? So they provided uh, additional help basically for these kids. Those are the ones that were in the treatment group. I don't have to tell you that the ones in the no treatment group didn't get these things, okay? And these are kids that were pretty needy, okay? Results show that by the third year, okay, uh, the treatment group had higher IQs. When their IQs were tested, they had higher IQs, okay? By age 15, when they followed up down the road, right, the treatment group still had a higher IQ and had higher achievement scores in math and reading. They were also uh, the, the control group that didn't get uh, the, that additional help, right? Uh, they were two times more likely to be in special ed by age 15. And a little bit more than a third, about 35% of the treatment group actually went on to college and only about 14% of the no treatment group went on to college. So it makes a big difference for those children who are needy, right? If they get these services, if they have these things. But it was meant for poor children and children who are needy. Parents complain, why doesn't my kid qualify? Why can't you do that for my kid when their kids aren't needy? So nowadays when there are programs like this, they're not allowed to exclude children, you know? Um, so anyone can kind of be a part of these programs, but you might have to pay for some of them if you can afford it. If you can't, then it's different. But, uh, but in other words, they, they can't limit access anymore. It used to be just for needy children, now they opened it up for everybody, but it has the most benefits for those children who are needy, okay? And looks like that's it, guys. So I will stop recording.